This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 821, recorded on October 22nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Although I sat outside earlier to have lunch with my lab and it was pretty nice out there too. I'm a little sad that I can't record from out there. Uh, it's 66, <laughs> uh, blue skies, puffy clouds. Very nice. Not sure what it's like. I, I went up to Columbia this morning and then it came down here, but I don't remember what it was like. Uh, let's see. My phone says it is... 20C and cloudy. Hmm. How about that? Uh, today is the days of, of 21s and 22. Huh? It's 10, 22, 21, and this is episode 821. How about that? Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, 84 degrees. It says mostly cloudy, but I'm seeing a lot of sunshine out my window. I have a window, Vincent. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. You know, it's all good. Uh, it's nice to have a window, yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to have one at uh, Columbia, but, well, it's still there. It's up there and technically still my office, but. The window is still there. there. It's a lovely view, I have to say, but I have to just uh, move on. And, uh, yeah, there's uh, these windows will eventually be completely covered up. But there, as I said, there's one more in the other part of the suite, so I can always go over there and you look You need out. to get some sort of uh, big screen that has some sort of window video going on. Oh, oh you know what? Wall. One of our listeners, uh, Anthony, he said I should put a webcam out the window yeah, and then have it piped into the screen here so I can see what it's like. That's yeah. a good idea. That's a good idea. I think I will do that, <laughs> yeah. All right, today we have a couple of papers for you, and one is uh, non-SARS-CoV-2 and the other is SARS-CoV-2. So let's start with non-SARS-CoV-2. This is a Journal of Virology accepted manuscript entitled Evolution and Diversity of Bat and Rodent Paramyxoviruses from North America. In North America, it's really Arizona, <laughs> right? But that's important given how many, you know, when I think of some of these viruses, I don't think of the Western Hemisphere. I think, oh. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's fine. But but I, I wish it were more broad, but it's not easy to do this. The authors are Brendan Larson, Sophie Grisils, Hans Otto, and Michael Warabi from the University of Arizona and uh, the uh, Mariga Institute in Belgium. That's University of Arizona in Tucson. Right. There are there, there, there's multiple campuses. Multiple campuses. Is... Uh, is Grant at a University of Arizona? Uh, he he is at Arizona State University. Okay, so that's different, right? Uh, that's uh, yeah, and I don't really I don't, I don't know how, you know I'm only really familiar. Well, I guess I'm familiar with uh, the UT system and the uh, Florida system, the California system. I don't really know how it works in uh, Arizona. Somebody will write in and let us know. I but a lot in, of our friends are in Tucson. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I okay. think this is. I think Arizona State's is Tempe. Um, Tucson yes. is the only place I've been, and I've uh, including to University of Arizona. And it's a lovely place. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so uh, Grant is in Tempe. Grant is in Tempe. Um, and I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm going to blow this. I'm not even going to try. Okay. Uh, it'll come to and, me. Uh, we have a lot so, of friends uh, in Tucson. Lynn Enquist, I believe, is yes, in Tucson, he's there. He right? has essentially uh, retired there, and. Um, uh, Jim Allwine. Right, right. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I've got it almost tip of my tongue. <laughs> uh, I'll get it. I'll come back. Okay. All right. So this is a wildlife sampling paper. And I'm always interested in these because uh, wildlife is cool, first of all. And, um, and we don't know much about the viruses in wildlife. 
right? We know very little. So this is another sampling one. And this is not coronaviruses, it's paramyxoviruses. And uh, you may not be thinking much about paramyxoviruses. This is a group of enveloped RNA viruses with negative stranded RNA genomes. Some of them are human pathogens, some of them are zoonotic. So we have measles virus, uh, mumps virus, and then what used to be called para-influenza viruses have now been renamed respirovirus. <laughs> I don't know if it's so cool. I, I like para-influenza, but that's fine. I, I wasn't consulted. This, these para respiroviruses or respiro. What do you think? It's respiro or respiro? I have no idea. I, I don't know. They did not consult. I me. guess it's respiratory tract, right? Or some people say respiratory. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, viruses that cause respiratory disease in kids. Felicia Goodrum. Yes, Felicia Goodrum, there. right. Yes. Uh, well, Marty Hewlett's also there. He's retired for many years. Did you know Marty Hewlett? No. He was a, he was a polio guy out of David Baltimore's lab. Now, Hendra virus and Nipah virus are paramyxoviruses. These are the zoonotic viruses that, are, well, they, they occasionally ca cause uh, human infections, quite lethal. So Hendra comes from fruit bats to horses to people. And uh, every now and then there's a little spillover. It doesn't transmit well among people. It usually fizzles out. And then Nipah virus, of course, fruit bats to people. Uh, and um, that happens in the, in the Nipah belt. We talked about that on a paper on TWIV some time ago where the fruit bats are in Bangladesh. Is it Bangladesh? I know it's the parts of India. Uh, yeah. It was originally, the first outbreak was Malaysia, uh, but they, they don't have that anymore there. But now it seems to be in, and, and if you visited outbreak, the, uh, the uh, exhibit, the Smithsonian exhibit, uh, they have a reconstruction of a, date palm sap collection and people in, in these areas like to drink date palm sap, right? You tap a palm tree, a date palm tree, you collect sap and you leave these open containers and infections with Nipah have been associated with consumption of date palm sap. And the reason is at night, the bats like to sip, <laughs> they go in, they sip the sap and they, <laughs> they urinate and put virus in and then People get infected. And so the low-tech solution was to cover the collection vessels. <laughs> and they have a nice model of that. At, did any of you go to see Outbreak? Yes. Uh, oh, it's awesome. Isn't it cool? And we did a TWIV sitting right in the middle of it, I think right next to the date palm sap tree. <laughs> Very With, cool. Uh, anyway. Ed was at that, right? That's right. Uh, Ed Niles was at that TWIV. He was he was a docent. Maybe right. he still is. Uh, well, uh, Corona has uh, sort of squashed. The, uh, uh -huh. the, the, there have been limited visiting uh, to the um, to the museums, and uh, Ed has not uh, been for a while. He's uh, fearing that it his tenure as a docent may be. Yeah, over, bad. but we'll see. If, if there are people fun. who have not seen it, um, who are interested because of coronavirus, uh, there is actually an online uh, view yeah. of it from the Smithsonian's website. All right. So um, this is about sampling for paramyxoviruses in uh, bats and various rodents. And um, I, I, some time ago, we did a paper. It's a long time ago. Uh, with a guest, Connor, who his last name is escaping me, but he was a, I think he was a student with Paul Dupre, but he was part of a study looking at paramyxoviruses in various wildlife, and they found so many of them. I think bats. That was a bat study. See, I, I just don't remember. But what, what do paramyxoviruses infect? A lot of them, although we don't have a lot of isolates. Reptiles, fish, um, horses. That's a mammal, other mammals, more mammals, rodents, tree shrews, and bats. As far as we know, right? Who knows? They could infect more, but we just haven't sampled them. Has anyone sampled a coelacanth for paramyxoviruses? Yeah, Probably wasn't not. there, um, <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm mixing this up in this paper. Uh, weren't there in the phylogeny, 
weren't there uh, reptile paramyx, paramyxoviruses Reptiles, yeah. and yeah. fish paramyxoviruses? So yep. my guess is anything that's got a backbone has probably got a paramyxovirus. Probably. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were some invertebrate paramyxoviruses out there as well. One of the focus one of the focuses of this paper, besides isolating and sequencing, well, actually they get genome sequenced, they don't isolate viruses, is receptor utilization. And some paramyxoviruses, the receptor on cells is sialic acid, and for others, it's some kind of protein, some diverse protein. And they're going to uh, look at that as well. So these are envelope viruses. They have spike proteins. Uh, in the envelope, and the spikes are different. Some of them have HN, hemagglutinin neuraminidase, and some of them have hemagglutinin and G, different names, separate spikes. So in the 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 HN bearing paramyxos tend to bind sialic acid, and the HG bearing tend to bind proteins, cell surface proteins. Uh, and of course, I don't know if I mentioned respiratory syncytial virus. Of course, is part of is a paramyxovirus, right? Did you mention measles? I he mentioned did, yeah. measles and mumps. Yeah. Um. So these are uh, these are potent, uh, Some of these are important human pathogens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's evidence of spillover for some of these, and right. so if we're trying to an anticipate the next pandemic, this is a reservoir that bears study. Yeah, we, we haven't looked enough at these, so uh, it should be looked at more. So this is a good study. Um, so what they did was from 2015 to 2018, they captured 358 bats and rodents from 12 different locations in southern Arizona. And so they capture bats in mist nets, these very thin nets that they put up and the bats fly into them. And then they, they get stuck. Eric Donaldson told us all about this because he's done this. And then they put them in brown paper bags. <laughs> this is the funniest thing. We put the bats in brown paper bags <laughs> and they, they keep them there. They weigh them. And then, of course, the bats pee and poop sometimes when they're in the bag because captured animals often do that. I would. I mean, I spent the morning, you know, inoculating and bleeding mice. And as soon as you pick them up, they pee and poop all over the place. Here I am with a nice sterile needle trying to, and then they're, they're peeing and pooping, right? I don't blame them. I'm holding them upside yeah. down by the scruff of their neck, you know? So then you can collect the feces and urine out of the bag. They can do swabs, oral and rectal swabs. They can do, um, they measure their forearm length, which I guess is important for telling what kind of bat it is, right? Yes. Although I guess you could do mitochondrial DNA sequencing also. Probably gives you an idea how old they are or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it know. does also classify age. And then uh, they capture rodents with Sherman traps. These are these little metal boxes, rect rectangles with a, a, a kind of a, a mesh at each end set up. And when the mice go in, it snaps shut. I have a whole bunch of them in my backyard, which I was supposed to use. But now I found that you need a permit to trap wild animals, so... Now I'm, I'm inhibited to do that. Everybody gets let go, uh, and Everyone they go home go. and tell all their buddies these stories about how they were abducted by aliens. Now, the, the rodents get put into a Ziploc bag. They don't get into brown bags. I don't know why, but then they measure them, and they weigh them. They get oral and rectal swabs, and uh, sometimes they have feces and urine in the bag, so they will get those. Maybe they, and then they bring maybe it they back. Eat their way out of the brown paper bags. It <laughs> could be. I was thinking of that. The mice, the mice, the rodents might do that, right? Yeah, they're feisty little critters. Boy, they're just so feisty, and I don't blame them. You know, I pick them up by the scruff of the neck, and they always want to turn around and bite you right away, unless you're quick. They want to bite you, <laughs> and their teeth are long, they're curved upwards, and really sharp. Really amazing. Um, anyway, mouse behavior in the in the lab anyway is quite fascinating. It's really cool. They just reproduce all the time. That's it. They just make more mice. You know, that's why they're 40% of all mammals, rodents. They just make more. So they bring these specimens back to the lab. They extract 
the nucleic acids. They do reverse transcription to convert RNA to DNA. They then um, they did a little bit of uh, PCR, but really in the end, they use degenerate primers that will recognize lots of uh, paramyxoviruses, and they uh, get genome sequences. And, and an important point here is that none of these animals appeared sick. Appeared. They had no signs. Those would be signs because symptoms, they can't tell you. A symptom is what you, what you tell someone. I have a stomachache, right? But mice don't, have, don't tell you symptoms. So you have to measure something and that would be a sign. Yeah, they, they screen the samples with degenerate primer sets. Uh, and so which would recognize different members of this uh, paramix of Uridae. 53 samples were positive uh, by this one primer set. 36% of all rodents tested were positive, paramix of virus positive, 9% of bats. So we have 90 rodents tested representing 15 species. Right. We have 268 bats tested representing about 18 species. Uh, uh, three genera in the cases of uh, in the case of bats, two genera in the case of the rodents, <clears throat> and as Vincent said, thirty six percent of the rodents, nine percent of the bats, which they say is not inconsistent with what has been seen elsewhere. Yep, and that species typing was done uh, by the forearm length um, measurement, yeah. as well as uh, for some of the species, the animals, or for those who they couldn't decide on, they used uh, PCR for cytochrome B. Mm-hmm. They, they got a few uh, full-length genomes, I think three, which makes me think someone should make virus at one point, see if it can affect human cells, right? Yeah. Yeah. So annoy, I, have, uh, uh, I have a question about the full genome sequencing. This is Illumina sequencing, right? So you're getting short reads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can... Uh, overlap those and make what we call contigs, which is a bunch of reads matched to each other and stuck together. And they, you know, sometimes they have gaps, they have to fill those in and that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> if you had a heterogeneous population of viruses and you're doing just short reads, you could put, put together a genome that's not a real genome, okay, yeah. but, a, but a hybrid. Um, uh, but I'm assuming... Uh, first of all, that if you did that, there would be some heterogeneity in the sequence of, if you had multiple sequences present, you'd get heterogeneity in the reads for any given sequence. So that would be an indication that you're looking at multiple reads. Plus, I assume that they're looking at, you know, obviously they're looking at samples from individual animals and the likelihood that there's more than one virus infecting a given animal is yeah. slim. So even though the, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm making this up, but I'm assuming that uh, even though they're assembling these from short reads, that they probably represent uh, uh, real individual viruses. Yeah, most likely. And what they can do also is, um, I mean, if there are gaps, they can fill it in with Sanger sequencing, right? right. And then there are long read techniques that they could just run some samples through to make sure that they're aligning it properly. Yeah, I looked for that. I didn't I didn't see anything like that, but yeah. I only really looked quick. Yeah, they, they did the gap yeah. filling, but not the long read. I don't think they did long reads, but that's an option right. if you want to do that. I don't think it's a problem. It's just something that was on my mind as I was reading those. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the main takeaways don't depend on full genomes, no. right? So, so then they do a, a number of phylogenetic relationships and try and put these in with what we know. So for example, um, 19 out of 20, uh, what's RMHPA, param, or it's RMH? Uh, I think it was, no, I don't remember, sorry. It's all right. Anyway, so that one was 15, 19 out of 20 bat samples, positive bat samples, they formed a clade with other known bat viruses in a genus that's been proposed. It's called Shan virus. It's not yet been accepted by Jens Kuhn. I mean, by the ICTV. <laughs> 15 uh, fall into another 
well-supported clade of known viruses, which has a variety of genera, for example, which we don't need to talk about. And then there were new ones that they didn't that found, formed separate um, clades, we'll say, and that's a, that are novel, which you would expect because you're going to find new viruses when you do this because you haven't sampled all that much. So there's a, there's quite a bit of that, and they they look at the genome organization, which is quite consistent uh, among the paramyxoviruses. You have a negative strand genome that encodes multiple mRNAs and a, a fairly well established set of proteins, like the glycoproteins, uh, polymerase, and other other proteins uh, as well. And I I do remember after second guessing myself, RMH is respirovirus, morbillivirus, and Hanipa virus. Okay, very good. Then they did a little exercise to uh, to examine the receptor specificity of uh, these viruses. So they uh, did some homology mo modeling. They have the glycoprotein and they can say, what does it look like compared to known crystal structures of, uh, of these glycoproteins? Um, and there's also a structure of a, one of these like HNs bound to sialic acid. And in fact, for at least one virus, um, it looks like one of their sequences anyway, it looks like it would bind sialic acid by the homology uh, in the modeling that they do, which is it's cool because it's quite diverged, right? Yet they say, yeah, it looks like it could bind sialic acid. Uh, and then some, some other of their spike sequences look like they would bind some protein that's not known at this point. Um, they tried to look at host specificity sampling an area where two closely related mem species occur in high densities. Um, but, um, but they, they do see host specificity. So every species appears to have its own little set of viruses. Right. And they do this thing as if, if I understand this correctly, correct me if I got this wrong, but we've seen this sort of thing before where they have a phylogenetic tree of the viruses compared to a phylogenetic tree yeah, of, of the, the hosts. Host, right? uh, and uh, the interpretation of that comparison is that the virus is co-evolved with the host, mm -hmm. uh, right. if I understand that correctly, and with very little evidence of species crossover. Yeah. All right, so that's pretty much it. 36% of rodents, 9% of bats uh, carried these sequences. And they say that's sort of what we've seen elsewhere. In Madagascar, 25% paramyxos in rodents, 3% um, in bats sampled at 15 different places, and 20% of rodents in Zambia, 1% of bats in Italy and 4% of bats on islands of the Southwest Indian Ocean. Boy, someone's doing a lot of traveling. It's yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Appears that rodents support a higher overall paramyxovirus infection burden than bats. And if that's true, it is consistent with these numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Looks like they say, well, maybe they're chronically infected. Who knows? Maybe in bats it's seasonal, so we're not catching it, right? So it always looks low when we're hitting them. We're sampling in low prevalence seasons. If you remember the the uh, the NEPA paper we did, where they looked for many years uh, at bats, they did serology. There's up and down periods where the antibodies are high, and then they go down, and they go up. So it looks like there's seasonal infection. So maybe it's the same thing here as well. Um, and they do say um, we have mostly short pieces here, so. Beware of phylogenetic relationships using short pieces of nucleic acid, which is true because I think they found some discrepancies with previous phylogenetic analyses that were based on short sequences. I think the most interesting aspect of this is what they did not do, and that is to see if they, they could recover virus and infect cells. But, of course, you have to recover the virus in some kind of cell, so who knows? Uh, yeah, I guess they, they said that, uh, if I recall correctly, they I think the full genome sequences they have don't go completely out to the end. Uh, to the end, They that's tried right. five prime and three prime race and were unsuccessful in both cases. So even though, you know, by and large, it's a complete genome that's sequence, right. uh, it, it's not, the ends, not yeah. complete enough necessarily to get infectious viruses. Well, and it's also really interesting to think about 
the idea that they were seeing most of these viruses having co-evolved with their hosts. And so if we're thinking about these uh, sort of potential spillover viruses, um, seeing that they seem to kind of all be specialist viruses instead of generalist viruses is an interesting message um, in thinking about spillover. Right. So race for, for folks not, not knowing, it's a method where you could get the ends of genomes that you don't pick up otherwise. Often you miss the ends. So they note here at the end that um, all the bat and rodent viruses that they see or genomes that they see are sisters to the respiratory, this respiratory genus at the RNA, at the receptor binding protein locus, although divergent everywhere else, which is interesting. So highly related in the receptor binding protein. But mostly, then they say, well, maybe there's recombination, but we don't think recombination happens in negative strand RNA viruses, which is something I think we just mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. or, no, Tuesday on TWIF, right? Yeah. Um, so they think maybe the, 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 the uh, attachment protein just can tolerate a lot of divergence and uh, the rest of the genome can't. So that's it. That's a cool, it's a nice little study, and I like it because we're adding to our understanding of what's out there. That's important. We are swimming in an ocean of viruses. We are, indeed. Yeah, the Earth is viral. Such a virosphere. All right, now for something different. Um, this is a science immunology paper. It's really an immunology paper, and we should do this on immune, but we only do one a month, so we'd never get to it, so... <laughs> I thought we could, and I'm glad to be, uh, I checked to see if Brienne was going to yes, be here. Yes, I was. So you're here. I am here. And I will admit, I was very excited when I looked at this paper um, because it is from the lab of someone named Aaron Schmidt. Um, yep. Aaron was actually a rotation student in my PhD lab. Um, I know Aaron pretty well. And so, uh, yay for oh, Aaron. Oh, cool. <laughs> See, Aaron's at Harvard Medical School, right? Yeah, that's very cool. Yes, the world is small. This is called Naive Human B Cells Engage the Receptor Binding Domain of SARS-CoV-2, Variants of Concern in Related Sarbeco Viruses. We have two co-first first authors, Jared Feldman and Julia Bowles, and Aaron Schmidt is the uh, corresponding author. Yeah, there seem to be two co-corresponding authors, uh, Daniel yeah. Lingwood and Aaron Schmidt. That's right. So this is from the Reagan Institute, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and the Harvard Medical School. So this is a cool uh, thing that um, we, go, goes into where antibodies come from. Um, you know, as you know, we, we you know, you, you recognize an antigen, or you get an antigen in the form of a pathogen or something foreign, and, and you make, among other things, uh, antibodies and. We know this happens for uh, SARS-CoV-2 because we're, we're getting infected and people make antibodies and uh, we're giving them vaccines and they make antibodies. And those antibodies are complicated proteins uh, and their origin is from a very interesting set of genes uh, in the host. And I thought maybe, Brian, you could give us a little, a very brief synopsis of the, the genes that encode antibodies and what happens first, right? The very the, what they call naive uh, B cells before you do much uh, somatic hypermutation and so forth. Sure. So, in order to make the variable region of the antibody, which is the part that is binding to antigen, um, the developing B cell actually takes some different small pieces of genes, mini genes. Um, there are a bunch of different ones in the genome. Uh, they're called V's, D's, and J segments, and basically combines those uh, to make a, so each B cell is going to make a different combination of V, D's, and J, um, or V and J in the light chain. And basically it's just, it's just about picking. Um, you know, I might pick V number one, J number seven, and uh, D number 23. Um, Rich would pick a different set, Vincent would pick a different set, and then as a result, you know, each of those would make a different receptor. Um, and that's how we get the, the diversity of these cells. So there's a, a certain number of mm -hmm. each of those segments. Yes. And as the cells from the germline, mm -hmm. as the uh, uh, initially naive B cells evolve, you kind of shuffle that deck, right? So, so it's get actually- get all possible combinations. So the idea is actually that the, the, before the B cell is even a naive B cell, 
in while it's developing to become a naive B cell, it shuffles the deck and right. picks some combinations. Right. Um, in that process, um, when it is putting together those mini genes, um, there is a little bit of adding and subtracting of base pairs. Um, okay, so, to add some more diversity. Yes, to add some more diversity. So the uh, ligation, the, the pasting together of the DNA is not always precise. So sometimes we add some new base pairs that gives us some even some additional diversity. So uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to this at different times during this paper, but I always, I think of this and present it to people with the understanding that due to all of this shuffling that you are born with before you ever see any antigen, a library of B cells with essentially relative to what you're going to see in your lifetime, an infinite array of specificities. Is that a fair statement? That's about how I characterize it. I kind of say one of each possibility. Right. And uh, beyond that, let me ask the question while it's on my mind. Uh, so now I'm born. I got this library. Do I continue shuffling the deck throughout my life? Uh, or for am B I cell- stuck with what I'm born with? For B cells, you continue shuffling throughout your life. Okay. So if I don't have it when I'm born, I got a chance of cooking it up later you, on. You are basically making some new B cells um, and some new combinations throughout your life. Yes. Okay. Good. That's comforting. So how many combinations can anybody make? Um, there are different estimates. Um, I'll uh-huh. say one estimate that I often talk about is 10 to the 13th. What, what is that? Billions and billions? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that that's would be 10 and, trillion, I think. Yeah. 10 is trillion. Right? Yeah. So it's and, beyond billions and yeah. billions. So basically when we say germline antibodies, mm-hmm. it doesn't really mean anything because everything is potentially in the germline, right? Well, so, so the, yeah. So a germline antibody basically means that um, the sequence involves the, those original V, D, and J pieces of DNA. That's a germline right. encoded antibody. The difference is that when B cells make it out into the lymph node after they've mm-hmm. seen antigen, they can pick up some additional mutations. Right. So they can further mutate those segments. And so, so that's that's somatic hypermutation? That's somatic hypermutation. Okay. So All that right. happens later. And so then um, those those antibodies are no longer germline antibodies. They've picked up additional mutations from the start. Right. But, okay, so that's the distinction. When you start to do SHM, somatic hypermutation, then you're no longer germline. Are there any antibodies that don't need any shuffling at all? Are they just ready to go from day one? Um, None that don't need the VDJ recombination. You always have to put together a VDJ. Always need to do that. Right. But the but the shuffling the the variable pieces does, does that always occur also? You mean somatic hypermutation? No, just putting together variable regions from different pieces, shuffling them. Does there any? No, for if you want to make an antibody, you have to right. do VDJ okay. recombination. Right. So I want to add right. a, I want to add a little historical perspective to this that's mm-hmm. actually reminiscent in a funny way of uh, a scientific puzzle that Vincent's going to address later in the picks. But historically, uh, people knew that you could basically make an antibody to anything, okay? Mm-hmm. And But they there were all sorts of calculations that went on all came to the same conclusion that you don't have enough DNA to do this. Yes. Okay. Yes. We're, we're right. like going right through my VDJ lecture. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so this was a, this was a puzzle for the longest right. time. And ultimately that puzzle was solved because people thought, you know, DNA is DNA. It's staying there. It's not moving. Okay. Mm-hmm. What you're born yeah. with is what you got. Okay. Or what you're conceived with is what you've got. Uh, but ultimately that problem was solved by the discovery that there are literal DNA recombination events during the uh, evolution of uh, B cells uh, that uh, rearrange things and add to the diversity. It's uh, amazing. And and when Rich says a long time, like people were worried about this and trying to figure this out for a long time, the first calculations were done, you know, in the early 1900s, like 1900 Mm -hmm. something. 
And the fact that this recombination thing happens was figured out in the 1970s. So who's responsible for figuring out the response, the recombination with that? Is that Tonegawa? That's Tonegawa. Tonegawa. Mm-hmm. And he got the Nobel Prize yep. for that, yes. right? Okay. That could be a seminal paper, right? It, it that is, could be a seminal uh, paper. It is very much a seminal paper. It's a really interesting paper <laughs> to read uh, for me with students because it involved um, some of the first restriction enzymes. Um, yeah. There are only two, uh, two that existed at the time, and he used one, <laughs> and it turns out if you used the other one, the experiment wouldn't have worked. Um, and it was also mm. before gels. Uh, before gel electrophoresis. So he has yeah, this yeah. weird thing where he has a gel in like fractions um, and trying to explain what that figure is to students uh, really throws off. Is that like a tube gel that he's sliced? Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. So he he did that in Japan, right? And then he moved to MIT later. Uh, I, I don't remember. I, yeah, because I, I was at MIT from 79 to 82. And in my last year, he moved okay. to MIT. And I know this because I, I could look out the window in, on our floor and see his office. <laughs> and I would just periodically see him. He was there all the time because <laughs> I was there a lot. And I would look out and he was there in his office. And, and he doesn't and do immunology often, anymore. He doesn't. And, and there were no computers. And he would sit at his desk often with his hands folded. And I imagined he was thinking, <laughs> right? With Computing. no input. Computing. Nowadays, people, you know, search and read papers and this and that. He was thinking. It's very cool. All right. So I, I had a, a wrong idea of germline. Basically, everything starts as a germline. Mm-hmm. And so to say an antibody against this virus is germline doesn't mean it's like saying the earth is round, it, right? It means that that antibody didn't require extra mutation. But most do, right? Oh, wait, that's a good question. Yeah. So do all, can all antigens be recognized by germline antibodies or do some require SHM? So I think I would say that as far as I understand, every antigen can be recognized at least weekly but it might be very weak. And somatic hypermutation is going to allow much better binding. Got it. And so the antibody is going to be sort of broad and weak in its recognition and will become more specific and stronger with somatic hypermutation. Biology is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, you couldn't invent this stuff. No, you could not no. invent this. There, there are a few um, <sighs> antigens that people talk about that are sort of deep crevices in proteins um, yeah. where somatic hypermutation is required to add a lot of base pairs um, to make kind mm-hmm. of this extra long loop to reach yeah, into that yeah, crevice. Yeah, yeah. But I think that there would still be some kind of very weak binding without that. Okay. Good. That's good. Now it makes more sense. So what they wanted to do in this paper is to find out what do these unmutated antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 look like, right? Because nobody's done that. Um, And so they took blood from people who were never infected with SARS-CoV-2, seronegative people. Never infected, never vaccinated. Never infected, never vaccinated. I guess they probably checked to make sure they were seronegative, right? I would assume so. Yes. I would assume so, because even if you were never tested, you could have been infected. So these are people that have never seen SARS-CoV-2, or at least it's never entered their body and reproduced and interacted with their immune system, right? And then um, they they need to pull out genes encoding antibodies, right? So they make a, a strategy. They And they want to look at the receptor binding domain specifically in this uh, paper, the RBD. Right, so they make a protein, an RBD protein, and they make one that will not interact with ACE2 because cells have ACE2 and that would screw up their their uh, experiments here. Um, and they also have an antibody against the RBM. They, they make this RBD so it won't interact with that antibody, okay? And so then they use this as a probe to isolate B cells from these people that will on their surface have an antibody that can recognize the RBD, right? And that that an, those cells have I, IgD on their surface, right? Yep, and that means that those are 
uh, B cells that have never seen antigen. Right. So they're, okay. they're I was going to ask about that. Yep. So right now what they're trying to do is find B cells that have never seen antigen. So you can imagine maybe these are some B cells that just got out of the bone marrow. So, once so those, again, are naive, right? those, are, those are naive, right? Those are naive B cells. Yeah. And this is done by fluorescence activated cell sorting, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So just to refresh people on that, because this never ceases to blow my mind, you can take a mixture of cells, you can react them with specific things that tag the cells, like something for IgD, and put them through this machine that can recognize the cells that are tagged the way you want them to and place them into a separate tube. Is that a fair statement? That is true. Ah, incredible. So they use this, <clears throat> this RBD that they made. So they have a regular RBD. Then they have one that is uh, changed so it won't bind. And they use it as a control in the flow sorting. So they only get B cells that will bind the spike specifically and not via the ACE2, right? You don't want it binding via ACE2. You want it binding via the antibody. Mm -hmm. So you've knocked out the ACE2 binding of your RBD. Otherwise, it would probably bind to all the B cells and you wouldn't get anywhere. Okay, so that's an important thing. So all the, they had eight donors, eight seronegative donors. All of them had <laughs> B cells that could bind RBM of SARS-CoV-2 spike. All of them, and never, and they've never seen it before. So this makes the, everything Brianne said it's true. <laughs> yes, Th this is where I tell my, this is where I point out to all of my immunology students that this recombination, this place where all of our B cells diversify themselves and make all the combinations, happens in the absence of antigen before you get infected. You make one of every right. type before you get infected. <laughs> So you could do this experiment with any antigen and you would pull out B cells from a person. Yes. Uh, of course, unless you don't know, were... people have encountered antigen. It's hard to, this one is easy because you're never, bit, you're seronegative, yeah. but other antigens, yeah. Yeah, so sometimes they'll do this out of things like cord blood um, to yeah. try to get around that issue. Um, the only time you wouldn't be able to find those B cells in some cases is if they're self-reactive. Okay, so uh, they got, the, they got, uh, Receptor binding domain, reactive B cells. Frequency is, all right, so they say total B cells and naive B cells, 0.0025% and 0.0029%. Uh, the, the naive versus total, they could tell by the surface markers, right? Mm -hmm. IgD plus IgG minus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's the frequency of these, 0.0025%. So here's my question. <laughs> <laughs> this really bothers me. Okay. If you uh, do, I did. I tried to figure out what that means in terms of one in a whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. came up with about one in forty thousand, which they confirm at the in, in their discussion. They say these are present at that sort of frequency, one in forty thousand. And I'm saying, wait a minute. If one in forty thousand of my B cells have this sort of specificity. Okay, then that suggests to me that I may only have uh, a total capacity of recognizing maybe, you know, there's another 39,999 uh, B cells out there with different specificities. That's not infinite. So then the question <laughs> comes, um, do these, what, is it possible that these same B cells might recognize some wildly different antigen and then uh, and then uh, mature to have a specificity for that antigen, okay? So is it possible that the naive B cells have really a, a broader specificity than just a single antigen, okay, but then can evolve to have a very specific uh, specificity? Does is, is that make sense? It does. So I'm going to give you two answers. Okay. So one answer is, yeah, so this comes out to one in 40,000. But remember, there's 10 to the 13th B cells. So there might be some that are present at a frequency of one in 10 to the 13th. Um, so that, right. okay. so A, you, your number is a little off, but okay. not terribly far off. It still gives you the same problem of it's not infinity. Right. Um, 
And so some part of that will be cross-reactivity. Okay. And so some of these B cells will actually act against slightly different antigens. And you can actually kind of tell that from the data that Vincent just cited, where total B cells are at a fraction of 0.0025 and naive are 0.0029. And so you kind of have a slight difference there. So it seems okay. like the, there are some, there's something going on with the cells that aren't naive, <laughs> have you know, some, if these people have never been infected, then they shouldn't have any B cells that aren't naive that respond here. And the reason is maybe they responded a teensy bit to something else okay. um, because of cross-reactivity. Good. Now, the, another factoid, which is interesting. So they say within the naive B cells that react with spike, the ones that react with RBM constitute 3.6%. So they say this means that there are a lot of other epitopes on spike, obviously, but it's a number. 3.6% of the naive B cells hit the RBM. So it's a big protein. There's a lot of other places to hit as well. Okay. Um, then they say, here's another factoid. Uh, the frequency of RBD-specific B cells in, in people that have either recovered from infection or been vaccinated, may increase tenfold upon exposure to antigen. It's been from some other studies. So that's going up tenfold. So they're proliferating in response to antigen, right? Basically. Okay. As they should. As they should. All right. So now they, they clone out the antibody genes from these cells. You've now sorted them singly according to binding RBD. So now you could pull those out one by one and extract DNA from one cell and you can clone out that DNA. So you can get lots of different antibody genes. They get 163 heavy light chain pairs, right? You need both to make an antibody, which they're going to do eventually. Every one of them is unique. <laughs> Every one of those 163 sequences is unique. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yes. And that's pretty important because that means that there's not just one way to get an antibody, not one sort of roll of the dice that gets you a SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody. And that means it's more likely to be made in every person if there are lots of ways you can make it. Right. And this isn't necessarily a complete picture of each individual either. I mean, this is just right. a sample. Okay, and the, the, then the technology um, here again amazes me. Okay, it's so cool. now we've isolated individual cells, individual cells with individual specificities, and now we've actually cloned the antibody genes out of those and expressed them, and we have antibodies. Give me a break. Now they observe a, a particular variable region that's overrepresented here. 20% is IGHV3-9, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So this is one of all the different shuffles that you could get, right? Yes. And so it, it sounds like that is a particularly good gene segment to use if you'd like to make a protein that binds um, RBM. So this is still in naive people, right? So this mm -hmm. says that they're pulling out because remember, they're biasing the whole thing, right? Yep. They're pulling out antibodies that will bind RBM and probably bind pretty well. I'm not sure they pick up really weak binders sure, exactly. in this, right? Yeah, and so, okay, so all, the, of the, all of those sort of germline antibodies had picked this same um, gene segment as one of the gene segments they combined. How, Rich, how, you imagine, how many segments you do imagine? I have to choose from? Uh, I, can, <laughs> I can look in my lecture notes <laughs> and tell you if all you'd right, like to go know. Ahead, go ahead. Rich, can you imagine if Brianne weren't here? Oh, I mean, I forget it. Well, you and I would stumble around and make three thousand yeah, no, mistakes. No, I, I, I would, I would recommend against trying this. <laughs> don't, don't try this at home. Only try it with uh, Brianne around. Yeah, no, I've been looking forward to this as because as, as as I look at something like this, I have many, many more questions than answers. Okay? Yeah, and I look forward we're, to we're basically, having we're basically, this conversation yeah. and, and getting the answers. Yeah, we're asking questions, essentially. Um, and then they find some other overrepresented uh, edge v, v segments. Um, so there's more than one way to do that. Yes. All right. So according to the Janeway Immunology textbook, um, there are 40 choices for V, 23 choices for D, and six choices for J, and that's for a heavy chain. And then to make a light chain, you've got 70 choices for V, 
and nine choices for Jay. Okay. Very good. Wow. Now, and if you just, if you do all those permutations, does Jane Way do the calculation? Um, n- not in a way that would be very helpful, but I can do it right now <laughs> because I just have to multiply those numbers together. Right. Um, and then Jane Way also, t- Jane Way does the calculation after you also add in the fact that uh, the um, ligation is not precise. And right. You add yeah. Uh, yeah. the base pairs. So if I do just the multiplication, I get 3,477,600. Uh, uh, both heavy. Does that, that include heavy and light together? Yep, that, that's how many antibodies you get. Huh. So 3.4 million. And then when you add in the have the um, junctional diversity, you get to five times ten to the thirteen. Wow! So the junctional diversity is really powerful. Yes, it is. As I recall, that recombination also is imprecise. So you get do you, do you get frame shifts and stuff like that? You just throw those away. Yes, exactly. Okay. Who knew that making mistakes would be good? Well, we did know that yeah. from viruses already. <clears throat> well, right? and evolution is all about mistakes, right? It's all about right. mistakes. Yep. That's why it kills me when the New York Times headline says the virus is mutating. Yeah. Really. This now is the cool thing. Most of these sequences were germline. That means no mutation, right, Brian? Yes, correct. No somatic hypermutation. Right. And they can tell that because it matches the genome sequence. Exactly. And that and that's important because if all of these Uh, required somatic hypermutation, it would be a little bit of luck of the draw as to whether my B cells picked up those particular mutations. It's possible my B cells might have picked them up and yours might not have. And that might be a reason why I might do okay after infection and you might not. But if if these antibodies are all germline, that means we're likely to all make them. You don't need this extra luck of mutation. So they say that um, they still got some sequences that deviated from germline, right? Despite sorting cells with a naive phenotype based on surface markers. So what do you think would cause that to happen? Um, IgD is not going to give you a perfect idea of naive cells. And so these might be some of those cells that had been cross-reactive against something else um, and that did have a little bit of response. Got it. All right. So... We got the antibody genes. Now we can make proteins. So they did that. They made 38 IgG antibodies, all of them against RBD, right? Um, Make light chain, make heavy chain. And um, then they can do ELISAs, binding assays, to see uh, that these do bind. And um, they have, what, five donors, 33 of these 38 bound to RBD with um, affinities from 3.3 to 400 nanomolar. So that's a big range, but that's what you would expect from just randomly put together stuff, yes, right? Yes, exactly. So 400 nanomolar is just low. It's lowish affinity. I mean, it's not terrible. It's not micromolar. But um, I guess that would be the limit of the sorting, right? Maybe if it's any higher, then you wouldn't pull yeah, it out. Yeah, it seems like know. it. Okay, Um, they do some more precise affinity using uh, biolayer interferometry, which used to be called BioCore, um, where basically you can put, if you have a protein-protein interacting pair, you put one on this chip and you flow the other across, and when it binds, you're shining light on it, and it changes the reflection of the light, and you can measure that very, very specifically. We did this years ago for poliovirus and receptor. I forgot what we put on the chip. Prob- I don't know if we put the receptor or the virus on the chip. And then you flow the other over and you can measure affinities. I think Biacor is the brand, right? Of machine. Maybe it's the brand, I, yeah. I think so too, but I always learned it as Biacor. Yeah, sure. I well, did, it's yeah. like calling a tissue a Kleenex. Kleenex. I thought I was thinking of the same thing. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so they get KDs. Now you can get actual KDs from this, ranging from six and a half to seventy-five micromolar. Uh, just ten of the twelve fabs had uh, those KDs, and and others had really high, over a hundred micromolar. And then they say, 
all of the FABs, so they just made the FAB, uh, they, they produced the FABs for these BIACOR, because you don't need the rest, I suppose, to do the BIACOR, right? Mm -hmm. Right, you just need the binding part. These have fast off rates. Remember, binding is a measure of binding and coming off, right? So you could be fast binding and slow off, which would give you a you know a good apparent KD, where you could bind on fast, but then come off really fast. Anyway, they say these all of these antibodies had characteristically fast off rates, which they say is characteristic for germline B cells, and you make up for it with avidity because there's a lot of B cell receptor on the surface of the cell. There's a lot. There's both a lot of B cell receptor on the surface of the cell, and the FAB is not alone. It's usually in a B cell uh, or an yep. antibody that has two copies of that <laughs> FAB, so you get uh, better binding. And in fact, oftentimes, our your first antibodies that are made are IgMs, which right. end up being five of these together. So you've actually got yeah, ten yeah. binding sites. So that compensates for that very uh, fast off rate. And then they say. Affinity gains via somatic hypermutation often result in slowing the off rate is a canonical mechanism of improving antigen binding. What a textbook statement, right? Yes. Isn't that great? <clears throat> so you mutate after this initial step and uh, it slows the off rate, you get higher affinity binding. And that's why it takes time to make really high affinity antibodies, right? Rounds of somatic hypermutation. Then there's there's selection in the uh, in the lymphoid organs, yep, right? You get rid of the center. crappy ones. Yep. Yeah, the germinal, germinal center centers, reaction. Yeah. You get rid of the poor binders, and uh, you keep the better ones. You keep doing that, and over and over. Didn't uh, Gabriel Rivera tell us all about that, Rich? Yes. when he was on TWIF. I think he did. Yes. So cool. Uh, and we so review. Cool. We've we've. We've gone over this a few times, and we've done germinal centers a few times, but that's school for B cells. The teacher you know, is Brian, the teacher is the antigen. Yeah, and and it's it's a competition type of thing. So basically, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a question of which B cells can access and bind to the antigen best. They get a signal, yeah. so they can keep going, and everybody else doesn't yeah, get a signal. It's very sad. It's like Even organic at that chemistry level. Uh, that used to uh, weed out the people who weren't serious <laughs> about science, right? <laughs> you know, Brienne, immunology is cool, but I, I have to say this. Sometimes immunologists make it too complicated. You know, I actually agree completely. Um, I think that that's one. I would love it if we all did a little bit better job trying to explain this to people better, if we want them to understand their vaccines and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give them a little bit of a break here because I think that uh, historically immunology was a lot of really pretty – strange phenomenology before they understood the molecular basis. And so there was a lot of phenomenology and vocabulary associated with that phenomenology uh, that was there before we really understood uh, at a molecular level the, the, the basis for this. And so that sort of complicates uh, the situation now. Yep. No, that is absolutely the case. Um, that's, I think, a really important point for people to understand about immunology. And I uh, there was an article in the past year um, in the Atlantic trying to explain immunology um, that Ed Young wrote, and it was called Immunology is Where Intuition Goes to Die. Um, <laughs> and I use that quote pretty often when explaining this. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay, so next. Do these naive antibodies bind variants of concern? Of course they're going to, Right. Of course, but this is a beautiful experiment. They got alpha, they have beta and delta spike, um, actually RBD only, right? These all have changes in, uh, in RBD. Alpha has N501Y, beta has K4, and they call them mutations, Brianne. Come on. I, I know, I know. Immunologists, um, uh, no, I can't just indict everyone, but they do say mutations K417N. They're not mutations. They're amino acid changes. K417N, E484K, and N501Y. And then, of course, Delta, L452R, and T478K. So they ask, do these antibodies that they have just made, pulled out of naive donors, do they bind these? And they do. 89% of the antibodies bind the B117. For B1351, 
which they say a variant formerly prevalent in South Africa. Formerly, like like Prince. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Fifty <laughs> uh, percent of the wild type binding IgGs also bound the variant. So not all of them, but they're changes, right? That's fine. Uh, and then fifty eight percent of the antibodies with affinity for wild type bound delta. Affinity, mean affinity, 100 nanomolar. So they do, and you would not expect otherwise, right, Brianne? No, I would not expect otherwise. This is exactly what we should have is sort of that broad but kind of weak binding with the germline antibodies that gets stronger and more specific with mutation. And, and that is why when you, in, in part, when you recover from infection and get a vaccine boost, you're amplifying these and going through more somatic and hypermutation and making them higher affinity for the they, they begin as being able to rep to recognize the variants and then they get better exactly. correct hmm. so it's like all the other almost all the other aspects of this pandemic we we it's there's nothing new but people seem to have had to discover it there, there's nothing new but at the same time, you know, when I read this paper, I think, man, I wish I had this paper when uh, a couple of weeks ago when I taught some of this exact stuff oh, to yeah, my students course. because it distills so many really important immunology principles yeah, in one study. Well, it does. And, uh, I yeah, and uh, some of the best papers are ones that examine things that, based on all the other things that you know. Uh, these things seem obvious, okay? But you'd have to do, and this is probably what you're talking about, uh, Brianne, you'd have to uh, look at 100 different papers exactly. in order to make that thing obvious to a class. But then somebody does the experiments that pulls it all yeah, together yeah. Mm -hmm. and really shines the light on what you thought might be obvious and says, oh, yeah, so that really is true. Let, let's but show he, that phenomenon all together in one place. Yes. So, so here's what I'm thinking. So the, the the observation made some time ago, you know, recovered people, you give them a boost, they make this incredibly broad repertoire of antibodies. Everyone's like, oh, well, there is no reason to be surprised at that. That's what we already know. It's a can. It's a canon of antibody production, right? It is a canon of antibody production. Though in the future, I will be referencing this paper too. No, this is good people. that it yeah. under. It just you have to do the experiment yeah. in the end, yes, you right? Do. You can't assume this is the way we think it is, and we can't assume it's for this. Right. So, and and to their credit, they are presenting it really clearly. Yeah. Right. So then they checked pre-emerging coronaviruses. Uh, these are viruses from bats. Coronavirus, sarbecoviruses, RBDs of sarbecoviruses from bats. WIV one, the famous Wuhan Institute of Virology one, <laughs> RATG thirteen, also famous and SHC14, less famous, but also the subject of uh, gain-of-function experiments. They have set between 73 and 90% um, amino acid identity. They, um, so let's see, they, they, they did react, three, three, four antibodies reacted with all of them, right? 17, 72, 109, 114 had broad reactivity to all of these that they tested. Uh, the, and, one, uh, one is SARS here. What's that? Is that SARS-1? Uh, yes, SARS-1. That's right. Okay. SARS-CoV RBD. So they, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. SARS-CoV and then WIV, v, V1, RETG13, and SHC14. Right. Um, and they all they have antibodies that will recognize all of those. And again, these are from naive donors. But again, you would not be, you should not be surprised, right? That's what you would expect. Mm -hmm. You could find, you could take any protein from any virus. Brian, if you took one of our paramyxovirus sequences that we just talked about and made a spike, you would find people with antibodies against you would. it, right? Yes. Wow. Now, um, of these cross-reactive antibodies, two derive from the same IGHV3-33 and L214 pairing, but were isolated from different donors, suggesting a shared or public clonotype. Please explain. So what that means is that they found 
uh, antibodies in multiple people that had picked the same uh, V region in the heavy chain and the same mm -hmm. V region in the light chain. So again, they had all kind of done these combinations and they picked some similar uh, V regions. So that means that there um, is likely a kind of general V region and uh, that gives you such a broad antibody. Doesn't mean the antibodies are the same. They could other parts of the rearrangement and and disjunction are going to make those antibodies different, right? But they pick exactly. from the um, same V region. Yeah, and the V region of all of these pieces that are getting picked is the biggest one. Okay. So uh, the, that section, that large section, is the same. So uh, something just popped into my head: public clonotype number one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the next set of experiments, they want to make sure these are not simply polyreactive antibodies, which I assume mean react with a lot of things. Yes, right? exactly. So they test some other antigens. They test uh, double-stranded DNA, LP, lipopolysaccharide, insulin. Um, and these are, they say these are common autoantigens, mm -hmm. right, where we see we make antibodies. And they didn't see any reactivity of any of these antibodies that they've just talked about, right? Yes. So there are some antibodies that sort of have weak but sticky binding. So they bind a little bit to pretty much everything. Um, and I will say that when I use, think of those, I most often think of antibodies that are binding to things like bacterial capsid, or sorry, bacterial right. capsule, right. Um, that sort of bind sort of weakly and stickily to pretty much everything or to a lot of things. So this, this recalls uh, our last um, twin this week in neuroscience where... We talked about uh, ant antibodies found in lupus patients, which are, you know, they're thought to be directed against DNA, but it turns out they react with a lot of other different proteins. They, yeah, they do. Um, Is that a similar idea, polyreactivity? Um, it's, it's possibly a similar reactivity, um, a similar idea. There are a couple of ideas. One of them is that you started out with an antibody against one antigen and you damaged some cells and made more bad antibodies. Um, and so um, some of those exact details are a little tricky, but okay. it could be some polyreactivity. And in that paper we did, it turned out these some of these antibodies recognize a channel and that could explain some of the behavioral issues in uh, lupus patients, right? Sure. Because their antibodies are hitting neurological channels. Mm -hmm. The next ask, can we, um, can we, use these antibodies and inactivate B cells. If we add the antigen, so they stick these antibodies in a, a stable B cell line and they put these antibody genes in and then they add uh, RBD and they measure activation. They measure calcium flux, Brianne. Mm -hmm. what, what's the reason for that? Um, so if you look at the signaling downstream of the B cell, um, that calcium I activation see. is one of the events and it's a, a pretty easy thing to measure by your by flow cytometry. And get this, I love this. To measure BCR activation, B cell receptor, we generated ferritin-based nanoparticles for multivalent RBD display using spy tag, spy catcher. What a name for a reagent, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and they can get activation with RBD of these cells, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they're not activated by influenza hemagglutinin nanoparticles. So they're specific for the RBD. So what does that mean, Brianne, that you could activate these B cells by adding RBD to these antibodies? Um, so that means that this, is a, these, this antibody is specific. This antibody is, is sort of not binding to something that is not its specific antigen. So a different the, antigen does not activate. The binding is consequential. Okay. So if if they bind, it's, it's not just that they bind. Yeah, it's a function, but yeah. It, ha, it, it actually translates into a function. That, that, that's sort of the next step in the pathway, right? Right. If, right. if it's going to, if it's, if they're real, if they're real antibodies that are going to have a consequence, then they need to be able to activate the, the B cell. Right. Right. But also the fact that they don't, they're not antibodies that bind to any old thing. Right. They don't get activated by right. influenza. Right. They only get activated right. by okay. SARS-CoV-2. So, so Brianne, these are now membrane bound 
and the antibody. So there's a, I presume there's a transmembrane and a cytosolic sequence on these. So there cells. is a um, transmembrane domain, um, mm-hmm. and the RNA is alternatively spliced to either include the transmembrane domain or not. And then uh, are there proteins attached to the cytosolic no, domain? Uh, that the- no, there's actually a very short, I think, if I remember correctly, it's only like three amino acids as a cytosolic domain, but there are mm-hmm. some other proteins that associate with, um, actually, the transmembrane domains. It's pretty cool. The transmembrane domains uh, of both the B cell receptor and this other protein have charged residues, so they attract in the they membrane. Attract. Okay. Um, and that sort of gives a little bit of a cytosolic domain for signaling. And that's how the signaling happens, mm-hmm. through that attached protein. That, that cool. sort of attached protein, yeah. And then that signaling causes the B cell to proliferate, right? Yes. Make a lot of B cells. Proliferate, and then, differentiate, make, an, make antibodies, do all sorts of good functions. So this B cell, this naive B cell then becomes either a, what, a plasma cell or a, a memory B it cell, could, right? It, uh, can become a plasma cell or a memory cell, yes, as it and differentiates. The, after it goes the plasma to school, cell, right? Yes. <laughs> the plasma cell then makes a boatload of antibodies, exactly. right? Exactly. It basically is becomes a specialized antibody factory. Okay. And then it will come out of the lymph organ and circulate, right? Uh, it will. Um, I think the plasma cells circulate a little less, but I'm not a B-cell expert on that part of it. But the idea okay. is it goes into the periphery, Yes. If that ha- isn't enough, then they solve the structure of one of these antibodies with RBD, actually with Spike. And they have, by cryo-EM, they have lovely pictures of this. And you can see the antibody binding the RBD in the up conformation. Now, if you remember, the uh, the S1 can be of Spike. There's two subunits, S1 and S2, could be in an up or a down position, right? Kind of randomly flicks up and down. And the idea is that it's got to be up to bind ACE2, and that's when these antibodies attach, and they will block binding. So you can see it's this antibody. One antibody is bound to RBD in the up conformation. You can see exactly how the antibodies interacting. They say it's primarily the heavy chain, and they can see the germline sequences, um, their contribution to the to the part. What do you call the part that's binding the epitope? And is that the paratope? Um, I usually call it either the complementarity determining region. CDR, the C- I call okay. it the CDR or the HVR. Uh, I think paratope is the right word, but I think I haven't used that word in a long time. I just use CDR. I saw paratope once here, and uh, yeah, they did mention it once. Um, so they can see the contribution of different parts of the antibody, which is quite nice. And then they can introduce some of these changes in, in uh, variants of concern and see what what effect that they, they would have, right? And see why they're disrupting uh, interaction. So for example, um, E484K disrupts one of these CDR hydrogen bond binding networks, and that's why it doesn't bind well and it doesn't neutralize well. So they say the cryostructure and binding data suggests that this antibody, AB090, represents a precursor of a class of RBM-directed SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. So this will mature further and become neutralizing. Exactly. Um, and then they do uh, they do their own form of somatic hypermutation, right? Yes. They have um, they produce these antibodies in yeast, so they're now on the surface of the yeast, and they mutagenize the antibody gene, and then they can select for uh, antibodies that bind with greater affinity to the RBD, basically, right? Mm-hmm. So you can do selection. So you set this up so that <laughs> you have a library of yeast cells, yeah. each one of which is expressing a unique but random variant, potentially. And then you right. can pan that library with uh, uh, ligand, which would be the uh, receptor binding motif and pull right. out the yeast that are expressing antibody that bind to that. You're sort of you're basically making a germinal center with yeast in a petri dish. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So they want to see if they can approximate what happens during somatic hypermutation, right? Mm-hmm. Which is cool, right? 
in the absence of being able to reconstitute a lymph node in, in a Petri dish. Yes. <laughs> so they find that one amino acid change, R72H in a particular region, um, uh, is dominant. It's in 60% of clones from this enriched process in yeast. And this position, they say multiple changes at this position – well, they actually say multiple mutations, but I'm saying multiple changes at this position confer an improvement in binding to B117. Isn't that cool? So this is one of the places that would change to allow binding to improve binding to B117. It's just going to happen randomly, yep. right? And then if you're infected with that, you're you're good. And that's only one out of uh, many, many such changes that could happen. Right. That could happen in the same antibody. So it gets right. better and so, better. The one thing I wondered is, do they see an, any of these changes in people who have either recovered and been vaccinated in their antibody repertoire? Do you know, Brian? I, I don't know. Um, I, that would be something to look that for, That would certainly right? be something to look for. What I think is really cool is they, they tell us where this um, this amino acid is that changed. Yeah. They mm -hmm. say it's FRWH3. Yeah. Um, that's called a framework region. So that's actually usually not in the part that that's, that wasn't in a CDR. That's not the part that was touching the antigen before, hmm. but now it sort of is making a contribution to touching the antigen. Hmm. You think it's touching well, or making a confirmation? It's, it's, yeah. Change. It's making some kind of change that is okay. influencing affinity. And so it, it could be either. You're correct. Um, but okay. it's sort of interesting that it's not in the part that was touching the antigen. It was in sort of one of the other parts. That's very cool. Very cool. These data show identify potential changes that can improve affinity while retaining initial antigen specificity. So they still bind RBD and they can, the antibodies can bind RBD, but they will accommodate changes in the variants, at least that one. I guess they looked at 2117 and 351. All right. The last experiment is to make virologists happy. <laughs> They ask, can these antibodies neutralize? Now, they use pseudovirus, pseudotype virus, which is fine. Um, and five of them, five of the 36 antibodies that they made, so they have their, pro, their antibodies that they have produced in cells, right? They mix them with pseudovirus. They do an infectivity assay. Five of the 36 had detectable levels of neutralization. They are from multiple donors. They had no commonality with respect to gene usage and CDR lengths. And remember, these five antibodies that they got yeah. are germline antibodies. So yes, the antibodies right. are able to neutralize before they even went through that improvement process of somatic hypermutation. I mean, it's not great, but it's some. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's uh, just detectable, right? It's, oh, that's cool. But that you would find that for any virus you checked, right? You would find that's some what, amount, yeah. <laughs> of neutralization, yeah. It's just amazing that we can do this. Right. Well, and it's, we got to well, think about why your immune system does that. You know, if, if your immune system didn't have that, if you couldn't neutralize a virus at all before somatic hypermutation, the virus would have, you know, a week or two to replicate with nothing neutralizing it. The virus mm -hmm. would always win. And so we sort of have to have this immune system with enough breadth to at least fight against every microbe a little. And so then what becomes memory cells are those somatically hypermutated. So you don't have to go through all of that again on, on a memory response, Exactly. Right? You can go through that all in a memory response. That's kind of one of the things that gets better upon a boost. Um, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit to... How many times you would go through SHM? Uh, or is there not, some kind of a check? Not that I know of, of any kind of huh. limit. Even in one response, even in response to, say, a prime, um, the cell might go through multiple rounds of mutation. So I don't know of any maximum number. Hmm. So if you kept boosting people, they're going to still mutate, but you might not get better than what you have after a few boosts. Yeah, right? exactly. And the, the mutations when you actually do this are uh, mutations in Cs. So you're always, you're always hitting a C mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the DNA. And so I guess at some point you could have changed all the Cs. 
<laughs> I suppose you could do that at some point. So, yeah, yeah, so this touches on where I want him to go. Uh-huh. I want him to take all these pe- I want him to take all these people and vaccinate them, and take time yeah. points, and then boost them and take more time points. Absolutely. Okay? And then probably send them down to uh, the clubs on Sixth Street in Austin on a Friday night and get them <laughs> infected. Okay, and take more time points and see what actually happens. You know. Um. So each point you want to pull out B cells Mm -hmm. with RBD and clone the genes out and study their affinity, their neutralization, and their sequence, right? Yeah, and if there are a way in these individuals to, I don't know how this would be done, but if there are a way to actually identify um, uh, maturing B cells that were derived from these naive cells, Mm -hmm. okay, Mm -hmm. So you could, so you could actually follow a lineage of naive cells, and yeah, I mean, out of a out of a given individual, you could see what, uh, you know, what gets selected out. I would assume that some some get selected out better than others, and then you could theoretically, I don't know how you would do this, uh, track the evolution of an individual yeah. lineage. So that has actually been done in the case of um, HIV specific B cells and HIV. Okay. In patients over the long term. Okay. The last thing they do is ask if these antibodies that we have now improved in yeast, are they better at, uh, do they have higher affinity and do they have, well, we know they have higher affinity. Do they do better at neutralization? So they do. (laughs) So R72H, remember that one amino acid change in the framework region, right, Brianne? Mm -hmm. Yep. Has the highest affinity game. It was the most potent neutralizer. IC50 in neutralization, 0.37 micrograms per mil. So they say it's cool. It got really better and there was only a small amount of change. Not a lot of, you don't need a lot of amino acid changes to make a big difference in affinity and neutralization capacity. I like that very much. Mm-hmm. I think that's very yeah, cool. Yeah, I think this is all awesome. Hey, your old your old buddy there has done well. I know. Great <laughs> yeah. job, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, so that's it. That's very cool. So I bet so bottom line, you have naive antibodies that can bind RBD, that can weakly uh, neutralize, and they get better when they somatically hypermutate. And so then they say, you know, maybe we can use this to um uh Improve vaccines. How would how would you do that, Brianne? Like, what would you? How would you use this information? So you could use this information to um, sort of make different immunogens. So you could make an immunogen, say, for a prime, a first shot that really hits those germline uh, antibodies well, and then you could make a slightly different antigen um, that hits a particular group of antibodies that have gotten one kind of mutation. And so you could sort of push the B cell along a lineage by selecting out different um, parts of that lineage with your different immunogens. I think I missed, didn't they look at uh, common cold RBDs? Yes, and they, and they don't react to those. It. They don't react. That's, that's interesting. So it's specifically yeah. Sarbeco viruses. Sarbeco, right. yes. Okay. Yeah, so that was kind of around the same place where they also looked at insulin yeah. and... LPS right. and so basically, training. you if you looked for RBD of the common cold, you'd find another bunch of antibodies that recognize those, right, mm-hmm. and related viruses. Okay, that's interesting. Now, um, so it's one amino acid change that gave this higher <laughs> affinity and higher neutralization. That's all it took. One amino acid. That's amazing. Um, the other thing they say, Brian, which I have a little issue with um, – they say, where is that? Um, germline endowed specificity for neutralizing antibody targets on RBD may contribute to the strong clinical efficacy observed for current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. But that's what you would expect, right? That's the way it works. Yeah, I think it, I think that that's what you'd expect, and that's the way it works. I think that the what what we also think about with some other situations is that there are some situations where we can make some great neutralizing antibodies, 
But those neutralizing antibodies are only things that are made after a lot of somatic hypermutation. Yeah, so right, there are right. there are settings where that's known, and in that case, oh, it, it would okay. be really hard to get your um, vaccine to elicit those quickly and without sort of a, quite a lot of work in making that immunogen. Here, since okay. kind of the normal immunogen works, everybody is going to make that specific combination, you don't need to luck out and get the right somatic hypermutation. Okay. It should work. Got it. Good, good. That's clear. Yeah, that's good. That so makes some things sense. are more immunogenic than others. Uh, even, and, and uh, uh, especially focusing on the germline. So, some things are going to um, make a response in everybody because they are targeting, or they use germline sequences. Um, okay. Some things only make a response in those who are lucky enough to make the right mutations okay. after making the germline. Now, uh, in HIV infected people, everybody makes a very, very small amount of broadly neutralizing antibodies, which are extensively somatically hypermutated. Exactly, right? and so that's part of the issue: is that um, it would be hard. It's hard to elicit those with with just one vaccine immunogen. Because you need to get, you first need to target the right B cell that uses the right germline sequence, and then you need to push that B cell into the right hypermutation. So, do do vaccine strategies attempt to do that? There are people who are trying to do that um, by using yeah. by doing exactly what I said in terms of having one kind of prime and different kinds of boosts to sort of push the B cell along the lineage. Um, but those are kind of still in research stages. So w when you say different, how is it a different immunogen? No, it should be the same it's, immunogen, It's the right? same immunogen with a few changes in amino acids so that only B cells that bind that particular immunogen really strongly get selected. And so we've kind of pushed the B cell down ah, okay. the lineage. So that's what you said earlier. Yep. That's one thing you could do is yep. pick an Im immunogen that would selectively amplify a certain... And that's why knowing which of these uh, antibodies right. and, are, are working well is important. Yeah, yeah, and you could pick one, and you say you pick one at the prime that really hits the germline well, and then hit a, use a different one at the boost that hits the somatically hypermutated uh, B cell well. <sighs> so cool. How tailored antibody responses. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. But we were lucky with... SARS-CoV-2. I that was going to say that I was wondering the same thing, okay? That I you know, within the general bad luck of a pandemic, I yes. wonder whether in some respects we were in quotes lucky. You know, that that that, that spike is spike is immunogenic that uh neutralizing spike is, or uh, uh reacting with spike has a neutralizing activity. Yeah, absolutely. I think the fact you only need a few amino acid changes to get a good neutralizing antibody is part of the issue. It's part of the reason why we were lucky, right? Mm -hmm. It could have been like HIV. Right. I mean, with HIV, the issue you have extensive antigenic variation you, you have, and that complicates. You got right? a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> you do. But in one person, you have extensive antigenic variation, and yeah. that's why the broadly neutralizings are great. But for SARS-CoV-2, you don't have as extensive uh, antigenic variation. We have variants arising, but they apparently can be dealt with. So I, I think that's we, – we were lucky that it turns out that you don't need a lot of uh, SHM. Um, yeah. Now I appreciate it. I, mean, I think that the vaccine design was good, right? Having yes. mRNAs is a good thing and everything, but you can have the best RNA nanoparticle, but if you have to do a whole lot of mutating to get a good antibody, it's not going to help, right? Exactly. That's yeah, exactly by right. Uh, using the word lucky, I don't want to diminish in any respect. No, no, science. I don't mean to do that. No, I'm talking no, about no. biologically yeah. lucky. Yeah. yeah. All right. That was great. Yeah. I loved that. Really I learned good. a I great learned a deal. And thank you, Brienne, for being our teacher yes, today. Of, of course. I was excited to uh, be able to talk about that. I, I'm glad you were here because we, this is kind of different where we all ask you questions, but I like it very much because uh, we wouldn't normally do this kind of a intense paper, immunology paper on uh, 
to live and we need to have someone who can explain it. So thank you. That's great. I learned a great deal. Uh, I wrote down here, there are 10 to the 13th B cells in a person. The 10 to the B-cells. 13th specificities. Specificities? Uh, specificities. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. Not B cells, right? right? Yeah. yeah. 10 to the 13th specificities. How many B cells do we have? More? I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, can try to find that, but I don't know it right now. Okay. Do you know how many different kinds of viral genome there are? Seven. That one I got. Yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I teach virology too. I know, I know, I know, I know. You teach virology. No, I can't ask you anything that would trip you up. And uh, oh, you can ask me plenty of things that would trip me up. But <laughs> okay, uh, it's four thirty. So let's do some picks. Um, yeah, we'll save these. There's some good letters. We'll save them for next week. Let's move. Let's scroll down here. Picks, Brian. What do you have for us? So I know I picked uh, the astronomy picture of the day the last time I was here. Uh, this it was yesterday's astronomy picture of the day, and when I saw it, um, it is now my home screen when I open a browser tab. Um, when I saw that yesterday, I was uh, pretty certain that I had to pick it. Um, I'm pretty sure I sort of exclaimed out loud about how cool that picture was. <laughs> um, so yesterday's astronomy picture of the day is something called the Dolphin Head Nebula. Um, and that, that is, yeah, so that is, um, basically, um, this, uh, part of, um, a bubble of, ne- of a nebula, um, where we are actually seeing a mission, um, it's coming from, um, a sort of star having exploded. This is about, uh, 70,000 years old. Um, and it's just the coolest thing <laughs> I, uh, you know, Kathy introduced me to APOD years ago. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And for a while I had that on my, you know, as my homepage when I opened the browser. And then I I stopped because uh, sometimes I like to have whatever I was doing continue, okay? And if this comes up as my homepage, I got to start over every time. But I no longer, I, I, uh, I recently changed back to APOD being... What starts my day? Yes, I uh, I started it. I think at the beginning of this semester, thanks to Kathy, and I am very glad that I did. Yeah, it's so funny. I used to do this ages ago when we first got computers and could do this, and then I just stopped doing it. But really, I loved it. It was great. <laughs> it was in the early days of the internet when there wasn't much. This was pretty cool. But that's so neat that. It looks like a dolphin. It really does. <laughs> it sure does. Yep. Rich, what do you have for us? Okay, so this is a little bit involved, but I, once again, I'm glad uh, Brienne is here for this one. I don't, don't think I would do it otherwise. This is about adjuvants, uh, and I'll tell you what the pick is first, and then I'll rationalize it for you. I picked uh, two articles, uh, one from The Atlantic called The Tree That Could Help Stop the Pandemic, uh, and it's about the uh, Chilean soap bark tree uh, from which saponin, uh, which is used in adjuvants, uh, is derived. Uh, and the other is from uh, Trends in Pharmacological Sciences, uh, which is a review article uh, saying, uh, titled Elucidating the Mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of Action of Saponin-Derived Adjuvants uh, by Dante... Marciani. So the first of these, The Atlantic, is, you know, it's a journalist's eye view of, uh, he's a science journalist, but uh, who I'm not really very familiar with. I'm sorry. Uh, The author is uh, Brendan Borrell, but I I looked him up. Uh, He writes for Scientific American and The Atlantic and a number of other things. He actually has some science background as a uh, uh, messing with uh, trees uh, in the in Central America, I think it was, the Panama or whatever. At any rate, so the first is sort of a a, a more popular sort of view of uh, the issues with uh, maintaining a saponin supply uh, from these uh, soap bark trees and um, also has some stuff about the history of adjuvants and what they do. And the second, the um, trends in pharmacological sciences. And I can't really, because this is out of my... 
a lane really, but I, I can't really attest to the quality of this, but I did look through this review and I got a, a, a fair amount out of it, including the mechanistic stuff. So I, I think it's a, a credible review. This all comes up because a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about the Novavax efficacy, uh, the issue came up of, uh, you know, why Novavax took so long. And I suggested that I had read somewhere that part of the issue might have been uh, the supply chain for the adjuvant that contains uh, saponin uh, and um, related to getting it out of these uh, soap bark trees uh, in Chile. Now, having read all this, I'm not sure that that's exactly true, and I'm not sure where I came up with it. Clearly, the uh, Atlantic article uh, talks about uh, how there is an issue with getting enough of this stuff from these trees. But I'm not sure that that's where, uh, not that it's all that important. I'm not sure that that's where Novavax had its problem. Novavax had other issues as well with manufacturing, not the least of which was initially a, a contract with Emergent Biosolutions, which uh, was the uh, same outfit that messed up the J&J vaccines. At any rate, that's not all that relevant necessarily, but we got some feedback from uh, a person who, uh, is an expert in these uh, saponin-based uh, adjuvants uh, who was mm, uh, not too happy with that particular discussion uh, and concerned in particular that it was a lame enough discussion so that uh, anti-vax types or even vaccine-hesitant types might come to g- come away from it thinking, oh my God, you're shooting me up with soap bark bark or whatever. Uh, and so I wanted to address that and, uh, just say a few words about adjuvants, which, uh, um, um, uh, Brianne can, uh, correct me with, uh, and, uh, hype the, uh, saponin based adjuvants. So, uh, several of the vaccines that are used against SARS-CoV and, and, and others are vaccines where the protein antigen is made in you after the injection. That includes the mRNA vaccines and the uh, viral vectored vaccines. Uh, Those vaccines, because of the fact the protein is made in you, as I understand it, are pretty good at inducing both a humoral and a T-cell cellular response. Uh, The Novavax vaccine is a protein that's preformed that you inject. It's not made in you. It's made uh, in a manufacturing project uh, process and then injected, as are many vaccines, protein vaccines. They are, I, I, I don't think you can generalize here, but many of those are not as good at stimulating a T-cell as well as a humoral response. And uh, ever since experiments in the 1920s, it has been recognized that uh, you can enhance the immunogenicity of these things by adding other things to the protein uh, adjuvant. So it's important that this sort of research has been going on for 100 years, okay? Uh, See, these uh, compounds that you add along with the protein are called adjuvants, and they have the effect generally of stimulating the immune system, and in particular, uh, in the more refined cases, nowadays, uh, stimulating the T-cell response. Not only that, but stimulating the appropriate T-cell response, the T-cell response, a Th1 response, uh, which uh, has as effector cells um, CD8 T-cells and macrophages, which is what you want when you're um, uh, dealing with a viral infection. Am I doing okay, Brianne? You're doing a great job. Um, I have a fun fact when you're done, but keep going. (laughs) So uh, there are several different types of antigens around uh, or adjuvants around. uh, And saponin, these uh, uh, compounds, and there's a whole family of them that come from originally from this uh, tree, uh, soap bark tree in Chile, uh, are particularly good at this. And they've been studied for decades. Okay, I I see uh, publications going back. Uh, to the 80s. Um, uh, One of them uh, in particular called uh, QS21, I think it is, is highlighted in this review paper. And it talks about mechanism. And that thing, uh, is at least if if this review paper is accurate, uh, actually stimulates by a specific interaction, T-cells directly, 
by interacting with a cell surface uh, protein and also stimulates dendritic cells to take up and process antigen. So it's working on uh, two arms uh, of that whole thing. So uh, the bottom line is that these supponents are extremely valuable compounds uh, in the context of vaccine adjuvants and very well studied, okay, uh, and uh, really uh, make the whole thing work and work really well. The Novavax vaccine, the dose is five micrograms, okay? It's trivial, and I don't think it would be anywhere uh, as effective or effective at all without the adjuvants. So these adjuvants are really uh, important, well-studied, well-understood components of the vaccines. Um, and just to conclude, uh, Novavax describes their particular adjuvant, which is called Matrix M, as composed of 40 nanometer particles based on saponin extracted from the uh, Kilaha saponara molina bark, that's the soap bark tree, together with cholesterol and phospholipid. Okay, so it's saponin, cholesterol, phospholipid in a nanoparticle, and beyond that, it's proprietary. Okay, so you don't know exactly what's in it. Uh, but it's, I want to reemphasize, very efficacious and very well studied. So first of all, Rich, thanks for um, these picks, including this review. Um, I'm looking forward to reading this because just the little bit I skimmed while we were talking, uh, I learned some things about uh, these adjuvants that I didn't know. So I'm excited to read about this and learn a little bit more. Um, but what I sort of found interesting is that earlier when we were talking about the paper, we talked about this diversity of antibodies and how many antigens could be recognized and how that had been something immunologists had thought about for a really long time. And then Rich mentioned this uh, idea that you had to use an adjuvant and that that has been thought about for a really long time since the 1920s. Um, it's actually the same guy. Oh, is that who did, right? <laughs> who did both of those things. Um, I reference, in fact, often the same uh, thing, uh, Carl Lindsteiner um, and his book, The Specificity of Serological Reactions, <laughs> um, is uh, did both of those things. And the adjuvant thing that Rich mentioned is sometimes referred to um, as the immunologist's dirty little secret. Yep. So Carl Lindsteiner also was the first to isolate poliovirus. He also discovered blood group yes, substances, yes, wow. I believe. Yep. And sp sp speaking of polio virus, it's interesting that the inactivated polio vaccine is not adjuvanted. Yes, yet, and it doesn't reproduce because it's inactivated with formalin, yet it works pretty well. And, you know, the hepatitis B vaccine, the um, HPV vaccine, those are all virus-like particles. They're adjuvanted because they don't give a good response without it. But I don't know why the polio vaccine works, IPV in particular. Never hmm. understood that. I have to think about that. I mean, some have suggested that maybe the RNA in the that, particle, That was right, kind of is, my thought, yeah. Could be tickling and, they, you know, and then you get a little inflammation. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Nobody's actually looked at that. It's very interesting. I guess they could have picked a different adjuvant, right, that didn't depend on this uh Yeah, this but, tree. you know, I think uh, – I think the adjuvant is as important as the antigen in this. And I think that these people have been yeah, working yeah. on this for a long, long time. Yeah. I, as you're describing the background on these adjuvants, um, this adjuvant is doing a lot more good things than I was aware of. Um, and so I uh, would agree with you that I think that this adjuvant is a, a key to it's, it's, having it's, things work. It's kind of like, this is so good that uh, it's worth tackling the supply problem somehow. And I, you know, these are really complicated molecules. I would, I would hope that ultimately somebody might be able to make them, but I'm not so sure because they're really, that, that's another thing in this review. They give structures of several members of the, of the saponin family. Okay. And they're extraordinarily complex molecules. Cool. Very cool. Actually, they do mention, I think it was in the review, that there's some effort going on. And Dixon actually uh, suggested this, uh, that maybe you could reconstitute the pathway in a cultured cell and make the saponins. Uh, or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, this is, what's, right. and yeah. this is what's addressed in this review, uh, you might be able to just uh, make a cell culture system from the tree. Okay. 
to make this opponent. So that sort of thing is being worked on. Yeah. The guy who sent you that email sent it to me too. And, uh, I think he was just being a little cranky, you know, that's okay. Uh, I think, uh, we didn't do a bad thing. I mean, Dixon was talking about what Dixon usually talks well, about. And, right? You know, yeah. we were just, we, we were doing what we do, which is we talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, so we, people and, don't and like we don't that. always get it right. Okay. We don't always uh, get your favorite thing right in particular. And that's fine. So write us and tell us that, you know, nicely that. Uh, nicely is the key. That's yeah. the key. I think that's important because I find quite often people say, and, and this really bugs me, you know, I've loved you guys for years, but that last episode, you were horrible. <laughs> well, could, you could say, I think there's some issues yeah. in this episode here. Yeah. They are. That's all you have to say. You don't have to say, I've loved you for a long time and now I don't love you because of this. Yeah. And then at the end, they'll often say, still love you. What the hell did you do that? What is it, tough love or something? <laughs> I just ignore all that stuff, you know. And try You're good. And, try you and got stick thick skin, man. Well, it's hard. I'm 73 years old. I'm retired. I, you know, I don't have, I don't have time for any of that stuff anymore. You're, you're not much older than me. Everybody's <laughs> different. That's, that's for sure. Okay. All right. So my, is, uh, my pick is uh, installment number three in the seminal papers in molecular biology. Now, you know, I'm, I happen to be teaching my virology course and guess what we just discussed on Wednesday. Oh, cool. Yeah. Transcription and RNA processing. So... Uh, I have two papers because the, this discovery was made independently by two groups. And this starts in the 60s where people are starting to realize that um, mRNAs uh, have precursors that are bigger than the mRNA that's in the cytoplasm that's on ribosomes. And they're all different sizes, so they're called heterogeneous nuclear RNAs because they're also found in the nucleus. And uh, they have caps at the 5' prime end. And the three prime end is polydenylated. So the the question is, how do you get these things processed and still maintain the ends? Right? It's like, like uh, Rich said, we thought DNA was DNA. It didn't move around. It didn't become, <laughs> it didn't shuffle like we talked about today. And then your your shibboleths are shot down. And so the the solution to this issue was done by two groups. One. Phil Sharp's group at MIT and the other Richard Roberts group at uh, Cold Spring Harbor. They both got the 1993 Nobel Prize for this was that splicing takes out pieces in the middle. It removes introns and leaves the coding regions or, or exons or non-coding as well, the parts of the final mRNA. And that was completely uh, a surprise. And in fact, um, the name, uh, the, one of the papers, so we have two papers published in 1977, uh, Birgit Moore and Sh Sharp spliced segments at the five prime terminus of adenovirus to late mRNA. So the key for both groups was to use adenovirus where it's easy to purify the, not only the, uh, pre, the mRNA precursor, but also you have the DNA. So they did hybridization studies of the DNA uh, with the RNA and saw big loops where there was no, there was sequence in the genome of the virus, and there were pieces missing from uh, the mRNA. Uh, and then Chow, Jelinas, Broker, and Roberts, an amazing sequence arrangement at the five prime ends of adenovirus two messenger RNA. So they're both using ad two. And I love that this. I would never forget this paper when I first saw it. Wow, it's amazing! <laughs> they have amazing in the title because <laughs> um, it was at the time. And uh, I want to show you. Here now, uh, the uh, the original experiment, and where is that? Oh, you're going to show the heteroduplex? I'm going to show you the heteroduplex here. So this is a tracing. So when, what they did is they took the genome. Uh, the, I think they just took a piece of the adenoviral genome, right? They didn't take yeah. the whole thing. They probably cut it with a restriction enzyme. Yeah. And they denatured the two strands and hybridized it to uh, hexon mRNA, which they could get in uh, in pure form. And the um, the surprise was that, uh, you know, a good part of the hexon hybridized to uh, the DNA, but there were clearly big loops of DNA. And they're shown here in this picture as uh, blue. There were three loops, one, two, three, where clearly 
something in the DNA didn't end up in the M mRNA. And that they figured out eventually was uh, removing introns from heterogeneous nuclear uh, RNA. And the bottom of this picture shows you the actual uh, structure uh, of the genome. You have um, the hexon mRNA body is a very small part down here. And then there's three parts, A, B, and C, that are removed by splicing. And those are the loops. And that leaves... Uh, the three black parts, which are the actually the non-coding sequence, the tripartite leader, spliced onto the body of the, uh, the hexon. And uh, it turned very quickly out to be this happened in many uh, viruses and in uh, other organisms as well. People started to look at it, and, uh, and now we understand that it is a fundamental process uh, that happens in virus-infected cells and uninfected cells. It has a variety of uses. It can help regulate gene expression. It, it can expand coding capacity. Can make different proteins from the same gene and so forth. So this that that fits the bill for a seminal um, discovery for sure. I think um, I have said in the past, and I think it's still true. I'd have to uh, sort of mull this over, but I think the discovery of splicing was the the biggest surprise and the biggest paradigm shift in my mm. uh, in thinking and in my scientific career. It's just absolutely amazing doesn't, doesn't even do it. Yeah. And I think most people who are around at the time have their splicing story. I got, yes. I got kind of, I got kind of two of them that I'm going to relate quickly. Uh, one is that now I got to go way back. I'm in graduate school. So I'm in my early twenties. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, Jim Darnell actually came and gave a seminar at Yale. I know there was a seminar on HNRNA, and he was, that was partly his thing. And I remember the discussion afterwards of people saying, what is this stuff? And is it even <laughs> relevant? Okay? <laughs> right. It may all right. just be garbage. I don't think it was even clear at that point that HNRNA was actually a precursor to messenger RNA. Okay? It may just be some sort of junk. Okay? So... That's one story. The other is that the way I first learned about this, now, now I'm a postdoc, 19, well, 1977, uh, at the ICRF, working with Bob Kamen. And Joe Sandbrook came over to visit. And he was at Cold Spring Harbor at the time. So he knew about this. Actually, I got a third little story. And so he knew about this. Um, and I was alone in the lab for some reason. And Joe was just so excited and he came up and he was just rattled off this whole thing to me. Okay. And I still pretty naive. I don't think I really fully grasped it. I wasn't sure because it's so outrageous. Okay. And then uh, my old mentor, Joan Stites, happened to be visiting around the same time. And she came in sometime later. Joe had gone. And I tried to relate this whole thing to her being, you know, faithful and communicating all this enthusiasm and stuff. And I got partway through it and it's, she was looking at me like I was crazy. And I started thinking like, oh, well, you know, maybe I got this wrong. And we decided, <laughs> we decided that Joe was probably just setting me up to pull a fast one on Cayman. Okay. <laughs> and to make a big joke on Cayman and make him believe this thing. It turns out it was all true. Okay. And of course it, solved a number of conundrums that we had been dealing with, okay, uh, in the laboratory. And everybody, else, of course, pulled out all their old films and realized that the things they couldn't explain before were now explicable by uh, splicing. And the one last thing is that the second author on this Roberts paper, Rich Gelinas, he and I were undergrads together at uh, Santa Cruz and uh, worked together in the laboratory of Rick Davern. So, hi, Rich. Cool. See, now I'm trying to also decide what was the most uh, mind-blowing thing of my scientific career. I haven't figured it out yet. But Isn't it the, the Tanagawa stuff that we talked about? That's pretty mind-blowing, right? Yeah. Yeah, but how I old were you? I up. wasn't alive then. <laughs> 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 well, okay. It's a small problem. Yeah. Uh, Actually, it may, yet, maybe, it may be yet to come. Brianne, it may be, yes. It may be yet to come. That's why I'm, I'm just sitting here going through trying to decide what it is. You know, no, it's, CRISPR. Did you come up with something? CRISPR is pretty amazing. CRISPR is sort of what I'm thinking about right yeah. now, yeah. No, PCR is PCR. a thing that, 
right? PCR is subtle. PCR again? 80, 83? Oh, I was alive. <laughs> <laughs> but you may, maybe you didn't know oh, about actually, it. I, yeah. You know what? I did not. <laughs> yeah, too young. No. So I was uh, a graduate student in 1977. I'm in the lab. Peter Palazzi comes in. He uh, had been to a meeting. And he comes in. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells me he just went to Cold Spring Harbor for a meeting and he heard about this splicing business. He was so excited and he went off. I had no idea what he was talking yeah. about. I just couldn't figure it out. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> it was so revolutionary that you, it was hard to understand. It, in, in the end, it's simple. But it was such such a revolutionary concept. Yeah. That you, you, it, it's hard to believe yourself as you're describing it. And and it gets even better because people then started to study the mechanism and, you know, how this whole thing is really an RNA catalyzed reaction. The proteins are just scaffolds. The spliceosome was figured out and, you know, the excision of the intron as a lariat. Oh, my gosh. Someone asked me on the virology the other day, what happens to the intron? I said, oh, that's a good question. It's a, It looks like a cowboy rope. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, and anyway, for the audience, I do want to uh, emphasize that uh, in terms of uh, consequence, um, an important thing here is that what it means is that in eukaryotic cells, where this uh, mostly happens, uh, the uh, genetics is modular. Okay, yeah, so that yeah. you can make one big transcript that has a whole bunch of different. Uh, potential modules in it and then splice it in different ways and come up with different proteins. So it expands the capability of genetic information and also on an evolutionary scale, okay, recombination can shuffle these modules. So a module can, through evolution, show up in a bunch of different contexts, okay? So uh, it really is a, 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 a diversification mechanism. And it not limited to DNA to transcription. Yep. RNA viruses can also splice uh, their RNA genomes. Uh, a, a couple number of years ago, I did an interview uh, with Phil Sharp for Principles of Virology, and I'll put a link to that. You can't find this. And it's only in the textbook, and it's not on YouTube. Uh, it's archived somewhere. So I'll put the link, and you can watch it. He's a, it's a good talk. He's, he's a really smart guy. Uh, we have a listener pick from Jason. Actually, we have two, I guess. All right, so Jason writes, I have to thank you for putting an enormous smile on my face by reading my letter about XKCD in 791. I saved it on my phone to play whenever I need an emotional boost. For my pick, I want to let you know the impact you're having well outside of virology. I just got off the phone with a coworker who asked, what do you think about the vaccines and the strains and people getting sick after two shots? He's a smart guy who was just besieged by mostly junk from all sides. So I reached into my biochemistry background and more importantly, what I've learned from TWIV to help explain how mRNA vaccines work, that they're designed to prevent illness and death, not infection, why they continue to work against Delta and friends, et cetera. He said it helped a lot, and now he's set on vaccinating his grade school kids once that's an option. And I owe that to you. Great rap. I love oh, that. Thank you. Yay. Like him. Many people have said your reach is actually outside of the listeners, right? Yeah, and that's, that's an important. example. Now for a somewhat unusual pick, are any of you into home automation? I've been dabbling for years with Home Assistant as the nerve center because of its cost, zero dollars, power, ease of use, and flexibility. How flexible, recent episode, quote, using Home Assistant to sequence COVID-19, end quote, features a researcher from Drexel University who goes into detail about how he turned a hobby into ways to save significant time, money, and effort in his lab. He's not a coder, so I'd bet other listeners could do it too. The website, home-assistant.io, and its podcasts are great places to learn more, and I'll be happy to answer questions too, though I'm far from an SME, subject matter expert, a very common term in the tech field. Thanks again for the information, education, entertaining banter this week in flyology and sanity. P.S. In case you're interested, some of my uses for Home Assistant are watering plants in my skylight based on soil dryness, opening a garage door and turning on lights, when my car is near the foot of my driveway, 
turning off those lights once I'm inside, toggling a light outside my office when I'm on a work call. Useful for the incubator, Vincent, so the family knows I'm busy. And the usual, like adjusting thermostats, controlling physical devices with Siri, etc. It's a lot of fun, and the barrier to entry is shockingly low. Again, I'm happy to help if you like. I could see um, you could get addicted to this. Oh, yes, very, very much. So I have my garage door uh, automated, not when a car approaches, but just to shut after 15 minutes of being open because a certain member of my family never closes <laughs> the garage door. And so I put this in, and you had to, you had to install a thing on the door, uh, but it's I got it on my phone, so... I get a notification when the garage door opens and closes, but more importantly, it closes it automatically after 10, 15 minutes, whatever you want. Um, so that's very cool. But I tried automating my lights, but HomeKit is very wonky, um, Jason. I, you know, it, it, the networking issues are just, I, I ended up, I bought some plugs that I wanted to automate to turn lights on. I threw them all out. It just didn't work. Yeah, I have voice control for all my lights at home. Um, That's cool. Uh, what, do you, what is it? Is it HomeKit based? No. It's, it's, a, just, it's all, it's uh, Alexa. Oh, it's Alexa based. Yeah, okay. It's Alexa based. And I can also do it with my phone. Uh, we have another pick from Alina. Hey, Vincent and all of our This Weekend friends. It's currently 68 Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius. Stunning autumn day in New York's Hudson Valley. I came across this simple little online game and thought you all might get a kick out of it. Uh, it's called Virus Craft, right? I think. Well, that's the, that's the uh, um, URL. Uh, description. As the player, your role is to save your host organisms from being infected by a virus. To do this, you need to change your host's receptor shapes. The more that match the virus spike proteins, the more likely an infection is. It's created by the University of Bath, the Milner Center for Evolution, and the UK Natural Environmental Research Council. Would love to know your thoughts on this particular teaching tool, other than the fact that it's adorable. Thank you for the podcast. I've learned more about the microbial world than I ever thought possible. I have to check it out. And um, if anyone has, let us know what you think. Give them some feedback. You don't know this one, do you, uh, Brianne? I don't, but I... Now want to get to know it. Yeah, this is new to me. Looks cool. That'll do it for TWIV number 821. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Please send us your question and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, please support us financially. We'd like to keep doing this. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Brianne Barker is at Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Drew University. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode, no, I don't say that anymore. <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>